Hey there, welcome back to another video. This time around, it is yet another rant and review, and the film in question is Halloween 5, The Revenge of Michael Myers. Which to me personally is not only a horrible horror or slasher film, it's also a horrible sequel. I know this film has its fans, teach their own, uh, I honestly have no problem with that, but... I have never been a fan of Halloween 5. That being said, I have tried to get into this movie. I have tried to give it chance after chance, and each time it just gets worse. The experience of watching Halloween 5 uh, gets more and more painful with each viewing. Uh, it gets more and more frustrating, uh, especially considering what they ultimately did uh, with the franchise later on, and it's just one of those movies that is aggravating, annoying, and boring all at the same time, and it's a prime example of a lazy, half-assed, and pathetic sequel that was really just rushed into theaters for a quick buck, which didn't work because this film is still, to this day, the lowest grossing film in the franchise. Now, I've also wondered things like, for instance, this tagline, uh, and this time they're ready. Who's ready? And what are they ready for? To suck Michael Myers' pasty white dick and balls? This is pretty much what happens. Because they don't do dick. They get uh, beaten pretty easily. Michael Myers lives, escapes from prison. Nothing ever really uh, changes. Uh, Michael Myers wins with the help of the man in black. And everybody is fucked. So, I, <laughs> I mean... And then if you count the... Uh, the events of Curse of Michael Myers, everybody is even more fucked. So, who, they're not ready for anything except to get fucked in the ass and fucked over. So, and so is the audience because this film sucks. Now, to me personally, after revisiting this, this is not the worst film in the Halloween franchise. I personally dislike uh, Curse of Michael Myers more because that's just so painfully generic. At least this has some decent visuals and atmosphere. This has a good performance by Daniel Harris, uh, who returns as Jamie here and delivers, honestly, one of her best performances. And... Donald Pleasance is uneven, but he succeeds in doing what he's asked to do, uh, which is be a creepy asshole version of Loomis, and that's because Donald Pleasance is such a really talented, or he was such a really talented actor. And there are some sequences in this film that I thought actually did have some genuine bits of suspense, uh, in particular the uh, laundry shoot scene. Uh, and I, I didn't mind the car chase when Michael Myers is in the car chasing after uh, Jamie in uh, the woods. But for the most part, it's a really lame, lazy, cash grab sequel. And it's very close to the bottom when it comes to this franchise. And this is also the moment when this franchise truly went off a cliff and crashed and burned. Uh, ever, ever since, it's just been varying degrees of Frankensteining something together and trotting Michael Myers' corpse out into the masses and into cinemas to, uh, to be perfectly honest, really dismal results for the most part. Uh, what's ironic about this zombie Michael Myers is that this franchise would literally become zombies uh, uh, Halloween uh, later uh, in its uh, run. 
which I, I really do find that pretty hilarious because it's based it essentially was zombie Michael Myers after this movie and then it literally becomes zombie uh, Halloween. Now, the film is directed by Dominique Ofen and Gerard, and like I said, I will give him props for his direction. I don't think he's that bad of a director. He knows how to handle movement of the camera well. He knows how to shoot sequences in terms of working with light and shadow to create uh, some genuinely eerie mood and atmosphere. Um, he has a certain intensity to, to his... Uh, camera work that I think does work with this kind of movie and that's why it's so frustrating that he decided that he was going to get even more involved with this film with the story with the dialogue with the characters with the direction of the franchise would take because I feel if he just stuck if he just uh decided to stay behind the camera and just be a director only and didn't decide to let his ego take over and uh, think that he was some uh, visionary and some uh, one-of-a-kind filmmaker and writer and, and mind and that he was going to be able to uh, be the right guy to uh, steer this franchise uh, and this film in that direction... This film could have been better. But also, I don't think that even if he decided not to take those extra steps that were completely unnecessary and the result of just massive ego tripping, um, I still feel the film would suck because the screenplay is practically non-existent. And the reason for that is that it was non-existent when they started shooting. It's never a good idea to shoot anything especially a feature film in a franchise without a script. That's another reason why this film is in a lot of ways similar to Alien 3 when it comes to a franchise-destroying sequel, because that film was shot on the fly, that screenplay is full of ideas and concepts that people just pulled out of their assholes while they were on the set, and that didn't work out and it doesn't work out here either and it just makes the franchise and the story and everything just so much more convoluted and messy and just really chaotic and a lot of that is completely it would have been completely avoided if they would have just taken their time instead of trying to rush this into theaters in the first place because this was shot like what maybe a year, possibly even less than that, after uh, principal photography ended on uh, Halloween 4. So, there was a very short turnaround with this particular film. Now, despite the fact that Dominique Ophin and Gerard is actually a somewhat talented director, he does tend to let his ego get the better of him. And as a result... There's a lot of people that have worked with him that aren't really fans of Dominique and his directing style. And he tended to butt heads with a lot of people. And I think he got into fights with Akkad and other producers when it comes to this film. And he's a big reason why this film is so chaotic when it comes to his story. Because he would just be like, uh, I don't like this. Or, hey, instead of going with this idea, go with my idea. And there, that just led to too many cooks in the kitchen and too many ingredients. Like, Dominique just felt like he needed to add his special sauce into everything. And it just made things too salty or too sweet. Or it made things just taste like shit. And he just needed to take a step back and just focus on directing. But it did, doesn't help either that he spent most of his time partying and drinking like a fucking fish when the camera stopped rolling and doing God knows what else with the rest of the cast and crew in their massive uh, wild parties that they had apparently while they were making this movie. Yeah, the producers of this film, they rented out an entire hotel and 
all the people who worked on this movie, from the effects guys to the cast and crew, are all talking about these wild, debaucherous parties that they apparently had, and they absolutely wrecked the hotel like they were some heavy metal legends, and it's just some crazy, wild shit. I wouldn't be surprised if half the time, Dominique Ophin and Gerard was coked out of his goddamn mind when he was doing this movie. And as a result, he wasn't fit to helm this film as a leader of men. Yes, he has talent when it comes to the ability to shoot sequences, to move the camera, to do other things like that from a technical standpoint, but none of that matters if you don't know how to lead your cast and crew. He just He's like if a guy who is just leading his crew into oblivion, willingly, because he's just fucking shit-faced all the time, or coked out. Now, I don't know for sure if he was coked out, but, I mean, this is the 80s, and it's not too much of a stretch. Also, he was so incompetent in other areas in terms of the safety of his cast... Uh, in particular, Don Shanks, the actor who, plays Michael My- who played Michael Myers in this movie, he was left inside a burning car for way longer than he ever should have because Dominique Gothen and Gerard and the rest of the crew decided to celebrate this explosion when the car crashes into the tree in a sequence in this film. They decided to just hoot and holler and woo! You know, oh man, that was such an epic explosion, dude. And they completely forgot that Don Shanks was still in the car. Thankfully, he wasn't too severely injured. But he easily could have been burned horribly. Or, I don't know, I mean, there's a chance if he was left in there any longer, he could have actually died. But here you have Dominique Othen and Gerard just being like, Yeah, well, that was a great explosion, man. Woo! And Don Shanks is still fucking burning in the car. And the burning car is a great representation of this franchise at this point. It's a burning car fire. So yeah. Dominique, Dominique, I don't feel, was the best leader of men as a director. And he's also responsible for a lot of the confusion among the cast and crew who would show up and they'd be twiddling their thumbs and they don't know what they're supposed to do for the day because they don't have anything yet and he's also the guy who decided to become a gatekeeper of the franchise for some reason because oh I don't like this screenplay uh, that features Rachel still alive and Jamie as a killer I don't like that how about we go with my ideas instead how about we you know use my ingredients we use my recipe it's like if a random fucking guy from the street walked right into uh, some kitchen at a restaurant and just started fucking making shit up, making orders up, throwing, you know, throwing his ideas into the into thing, into the mix and, you know, just started acting like he's the head chef and people just went along with it. And as a result, I don't think he's 100 percent to blame for the for how chaotic this film is, because a cod is also uh, at fault because he just let him do it. He just let him just take over the franchise and become some gatekeeper of it when he didn't deserve that uh, uh, moniker. He didn't deserve that title because he wasn't involved with the franchise in any capacity before he was hired to do this movie. And It's wonderful and great that Dominique, after he did this film, you know, later on in his life, he became this really big advocate for Down Syndrome, and I think it's a great thing, but there's a lot of things that really do uh, point to him not really being the best person, or, or, you know, and honestly being kind of an asshole on the set of a lot of his films. I know some people have got along with him. And, and, you know, that's that's all good and well. But, I mean, this is a guy where there's a lot of actual recollections from people who just were not on the same page with him or just could not stand 
how he uh, was directing. I mean, he was fired from The Omen 4, which was a TV movie uh, produced by Fox Television early in their... Uh, uh, trying to think of the right word. Uh, early in the genesis of that network. So the network was a new thing, and they were just trying to do anything to get ratings. So it's not like they had like super high expectations. It's a made-for-TV movie, and he got fired, and he was replaced weeks in. He had only directed for like a couple weeks, and then they just couldn't stand his ass and sent him packing. So that says a lot. And he hasn't directed a whole lot. He didn't direct a whole lot after that. Probably for good reason. So I'm glad that he did some good stuff afterwards. But that doesn't change the fact that he probably was an asshole to some a lot of people. When it comes to uh, how he handled himself around others on the set of films that he directed. And I would say his direction is honestly one of the few decent things about this movie after revisiting it. I don't think his direction is really that problematic. It's the other things about his direction in terms of his leadership, in terms of how he handled the production, in terms of him injecting himself into, and, and trying to insert himself into the writer's room. That's where the bigger problems lie. And speaking of those problems... Let's talk about the screenplay. The script is just varying different forms of shit that are pulled out of the asses of these writers on the set of this film. You got some hard as a rock pieces of shit. You got the pieces of shit that are very soft and squishy. You got the diarrhea and put it all together and you got a whole ton of shit to work with and if you got shit to work with when it comes to a story and a screenplay you you are going to have a shitty film because that's all that you had to work with in terms of your foundation it can't build something on a foundation of shit and so you have Michael Jacobs and Dominique Govan and Gerard. I think a cod at one point or some other people got involved. There was all these different cooks in the kitchen and it shows. There's all these ideas that are thrown out and thrown thrown out in the open and thrown around and in, in the desperate hopes that they would stick. And none of them do. Uh, for instance, um, Jamie all of a sudden now has a psychic connection, a psychic link with Michael Myers. Why? Because it's different and it's interesting and it's cool. It's not really that different or that interesting. It doesn't make any sense. Why the fuck does she have psych a psychic connection with Michael Myers? Th that wasn't established in any way or in any form in any of the other movies. Well, you know, it wasn't established that uh, Lori was Michael's... Uh, sister before either well that's that you can still work with that that's not like crazy random magic uh, psychic twin powers so uh <laughs> there's a big difference between those two things also speaking of jamie she's mute for some reason until the screenplay decides that she's not going to be mute anymore then what the fuck was even the point of having her be mute in the first place there is no point other than, oh, that's something we could do. There's a lot of that in this in this story. Oh, well, that's something that we could do. They didn't really think about things. They just pulled shit out of their ass and put it on the page, and that's it. Because they didn't give a fuck. They didn't care enough. They didn't put enough effort into things deliberately. I mean, they just wanted to get this shoot over with, or they just wanted to uh, get the the days shoot over with so they so they they can uh go back to their hotel and uh drink booze and uh party the night away it seems like the writers were spending more time thinking of what kind of party trick they were going to do that night than actually coming up with some legitimately 
cohesive uh, concepts and uh, paths for this story to follow or to, or, or to uh, add to this particular franchise. I mean, even other random stuff like Michael Myers cries in one scene and they try to make it like it's some big deal, like it provides humanity and, you know, makes it more him a more interesting and sympathetic character. Just because he cried for like 30 seconds? That's not how this works. And then they change things around. Like, all of a sudden, now Loomis is a total asshole and a creeper. Why? He wasn't anywhere near this bad of a person in any of the other films. Yes, he had moments of desperation. Yes, he had moments where he was kind of crossing or, or towing the line. But not to this extent. So it makes no sense that he would shift this much in this film and all of a sudden now Loomis is scaring the shit out of Jamie and pressuring her and stalking her and just being a complete desperate douchebag there's no reason for this shift in his character it's sudden it's too sudden a lot of these shifts with these characters a lot of these deaths like for instance the death of Rachel uh a lot of these other concepts, they are just too sudden. It's like whiplash. Really, this script is just loaded with whiplash, and it just gives you a headache. Because you're just like, why are you doing this? What the fuck is up with this bullshit? Why are you killing off Rachel, but then replacing her with Tina, who was terrible, and one of the most annoying characters in horror film history? Why the fuck did you kill her off only to replace her with this fucking bitch. I, I mean, it's like, why are we going this direction with this franchise? What the fuck is up with this man? In, this this man in black. Seriously, what was the fuck? What the fuck? What what, are, what were they even thinking with that guy? And the thing is, they didn't even fucking know. There's interviews where people are actually saying on camera they had no uh, idea who the man in black was. They were just halfway through the shoot. Things were not going well. They needed to add something to, I guess, provide some kind of interest to the audience. Some kind of mystery. So somebody just decided to throw in this mysterious man in black out of their fucking ass like everything else. Along with the thorn uh, symbol and all this other shit. And it just doesn't work because there's no thought put into it. It's just random fucking shit that just came up with on the fly. <laughs> I mean, they didn't want to commit to the ending of Halloween 4. So Jamie, uh, she didn't even kill her stepmother. She just wounded her. And now she's in a, in a hospital and there's other things too like and, it, and i don't even think this is in the script it just has to do with the production and art design and probably another uh problem with dominique Ofen and gerard's uh approach to directing in terms of handling the production i mean you got sequences in this hospital that look like they're shot in a, a really just completely different kind of film I know people pointed out that it looks like it's shot in Freddy's boiler room, and that's honestly a great way to put it. Because all of a sudden, Jamie's running around, and there's fucking steam everywhere, and it's dark, and it's just hot, and you're like, what the f What hospital is this that has, like, exposed steam shooting out of the fucking walls in the basement? Weird changes too, like Michael Myers' house is now some kind of Victorian mansion out of fucking nowhere. And there's just all this, this, all this fucking shit. There's a scene in the end where Michael Myers is arrested and he sits in his cell, turned away from the camera, like he just got put in time out. Oh, you better sit there, Michael, and think about what you did. <laughs> 
Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> the fuck? Come on. What is this bullshit? Michael Myers sitting in timeout. Michael Myers crying like a bitch. It's, it's just out of nowhere. Really not much context to it. Just trying to throw something once again trying to throw something random at the wall throwing some shit at the wall hoping it sticks hoping it lands on somebody and they like the way it tastes God. and what is up with this story and taking out most of the likable characters and leaving only one character you give a shit about in Jamie and half the film, she doesn't say any lines of dialogue. So there isn't much character development for her in terms of developing her character further. Because she's just mute and having seizures through half the movie. Until she finally starts speaking again. And at that point, she's just spending most of the movie screaming in terror anyway. And uh, trying to stay one step ahead of Michael Myers for the second time. Loomis is all of a sudden just some fucking asshole who's taking things way too far and the only other character that you could have remotely gave a shit about a Rachel they kill off like 15 minutes into the movie so then you're left with a cast of just characters that are incredibly unlikable or incredibly generic and boring in terms of their characterization and what I mean by these characters being awful is that they are poorly conceived in terms of the variety, for one. A lot of them have similar personality traits. A lot of them are just the same level of annoying or bland. So that does nothing in terms of making them uh, interesting or uh, helping the audience uh, engage with them more. And, and with their place in the story. And they also tend to not really provide a lot for these actors to work with. So the actors aren't really able to uh, make them come to life by adding their own personal quirks to things. But I also don't think these actors are really that great to begin with. So I don't really feel that they would have been able to make it work that well even if there was more for them to work with when it comes to these characters in terms of lines of dialogue or character development or so on and so forth because a lot of the genuine charisma and personality of these characters is not very good and I know Tina has fans but there's a reason why there is a whole legion of people and uh, horror fans who hate this character. And it's because she is the kind of annoying that is turned to 11 and is just hyperactive for reasons that don't make any sense. Like, there's no real reason for her to be this hyperactive. For this character to literally have lines of dialogue where she's like, I don't know what I'm doing! Like, they really don't normally have these characters up front and center and try to portray them as a hero either. So when you have this kind of character taking center stage and just continuing to be annoying and hyperactive and bouncing off the walls, it drives you up the fucking wall and it's unbelievably irritating. And it's, equally well it's not equally it's even more frustrating when that character is someone that is shoved down your throat as this new heroine and also this new sister uh uh or or uh, companion for jamie like the first words that jamie says in this in this film in this story is tina and that's just wrong and this is a character that wasn't even in Halloween 4. And you're just coming up with this new character who a lot of uh, audiences already hate. Uh, definitely myself included among that 
long list of people who hate Tina. And then she's now all of a sudden Jamie's best friend and uh, is, I guess, better than Rachel or on an equal playing field or on equal footing. And it's just incredibly inauthentic and insulting in a lot of ways. So, yeah, these characters are awful because they're poorly conceived and the decisions that the screenwriters make to put them in the particular positions that they are in are absolutely and uh, 100% questionable, to say the least. And it just all adds up to a really aggravating uh, mix that just does not do the film any favors at all. And these characters are a big reason why this film is such a bad movie. Uh, and then on top of that, you have dumb fucking cops straight out of the last house on the left, complete with clown music, with honking horns. What the fuck? <laughs> but yeah, this film really does have some awful characters. And it was their decision to kill off Rachel because, hey, we want to make sure that no one is safe. Yeah, because that always works out. That worked out so great in Alien 3 when they killed off Ripley. Well, they did kill off Ripley eventually. But when they killed off Hicks and Newt, in the beginning, worked off so well. Oh, no one is safe. Yeah, no one is safe from how shitty this film is. God. And you really feel for Ellie Cornell because there, there, there are interviews with her and she's justifiably disappointed with how her character was handled. I mean, Rachel didn't even put up a fight. She got stabbed with some scissors in the chest and died, and that was it. There was no dying with a bang. There was no dying being a hero. It was just dying with not even really a whimper. And that character did not deserve that kind of ending and that kind of death. And what makes it even more infuriating is that Tina gets a heroic death for some fucking reason, but not Rachel. The character that is the essentially the sister of Jamie, who we've already established in Halloween 4 as being someone who can hold her own against Michael Myers, and someone that Jamie really cares about. But then we kill her off and then try to replace her immediately with someone who is massively inferior and incredibly unlikable and irritating. Good job. Great job. Was that your idea, Dominique? Whose idea was that? Who, who, whoever had that idea, they should have been fired on the spot. Should have been like, oh... When soon as somebody says, yeah, let's kill off Rachel because then the audience will know that no one will be safe. And then let's replace her with uh, Tina, the annoying uh, character who in most movies would just be in the film for like 30, 40 minutes and be one of the first to die because the audience can't stand this fucking character any longer. No, let's make her the, the, the lead and replace Rachel as a hero, the, the hero because it's different. And there was no one on the set that, that immediately was like, get the fuck out of here with that bullshit and get pack your bags. Get the fuck off this set. You're going to give me that shit. Tina? We're going to make her the lead? We're going to kill off Rachel? And then go replace her with Tina, who's terrible, who's annoying as fuck? No, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> no. No. There was no one who was the voice of reason. When it comes to this film. Apparently Mustafa Cod Has uh, regretted the decision. To kill off Rachel. And you know it's too little too late. 
It really is. And it's not only the fact that Tina gets a heroic death, but all the other female characters in this film, the main characters at least, the ones that get the most screen time, they also put up more of a fight than Rachel does. I mean, the slutty devil chick who's like one of the friends, uh, uh, Samantha, even she puts up a fight against Michael Myers. But Rachel just gets stabbed once and she's fucking dead. Just horrible. Horrible decision making. Horrible. And yeah, all these characters, uh, they are really just the most annoying tropes in slasher films uh, times a hundred, and they are your main characters. This kills any semblance of suspense because you don't give a fuck anymore. You're just like, just kill him. Uh, I don't give a fuck about pretty boy, wannabe, John Travolta, uh, and Mike... Uh, I don't give a fuck about Spitz, who might as well be called Giggle Dick because he's a dick and he giggles like a fucking twat for most of the goddamn movie. I don't give a shit about uh, Samantha, the slutty devil chick, and I sure as hell don't give a fuck what happens to Tina, who's terrible and one of the worst characters in slasher film history. I hate this character so much. She's so annoying, and I don't understand the decision-making process of making her the new hero. And I wasn't alone, because there was a screening of this film when it came out, and when she died, the audience cheered. And I would have been right along with them. (laughs) And it's supposed to be this sad, tragic, heroic sacrifice. And the audience is like hooting and hollering and clapping that that she's dead. And she's out of the movie. Nothing against Wendy Kaplan, though. She seems like a real sweetheart. But I, I hate that character. She was just doing what she was asked to do. And no one was there on the set to tell her to do anything different. And you also have Bo Starr who comes back as Sheriff Ben Meeker, but it feels like he's just completely wasted and is barely even in the movie. I guess there was a version of the script where, and scenes that were shot where he died, but with those left out of the movie, it's as if he just shows up for a few scenes, then disappears, and then shows up again at the end. (laughs) And... This script, it also has a really shitty climax. Its climax is just Michael Myers in another old old dark house. This time it's supposed to be his house, but it's unlike any other house you've seen in any of the other films up to this point. And it just ends with Loomis trapping him with a net and beating him over the head with a two by four. And and apparently Loomis was supposed to die of a heart attack afterwards, too. And that's when Michael Myers gets arrested and gets fucking sent to time out. And then he gets broken out by the man in black. And Jamie screams, no. And I'm like, yeah, no, no, no. (laughs) I don't ever want to watch this movie again. God, yeah, damn it. Just the more I think about this movie, the more it just sucks. It really does. It's not entertaining. It's boring for a good chunk of the running time because there's no genuine suspense because I don't care about any of these characters. The only time I get any suspense is sequences when Jamie is being stalked by Michael Myers. The laundry chute scene. That's a really tense and harrowing sequence. I will give the film a lot of credit for that. Even the scene where she's running through the woods and the and the and Michael Myers is in the car chasing after her. But any of the other sequences 
don't work. There's a sequence in the barn that feels like it is an eternity because I don't give a fuck what happens to Giggle Dick, Slutty Devil Chick, and Tina the Terrible. So it just feels horribly long and drawn out. The kills aren't really anything that great either. Uh, Samantha gets killed with a scythe and she pretty much dies off screen. Uh, Spitz gets stabbed with a pitchfork in the chest, but because the effect didn't work properly, it doesn't really uh, register and doesn't really leave the visceral effect it intended to. Mike just Mike just gets like a a garden tool or farm what like a I don't even know what it is like a hoe or some shit I don't think it's a hoe, but it's like some kind of pokey thing, and it gets it stabbed in his in his head. That's what you get for wanting to fuck your car, <laughs> uh, because it's really there's a scene where he's like cleaning his car and it's shot in a way that looks like he's just fucking sexually attracted to his car and he's just like caressing it and 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 having foreplay with it it's like dude like you don't need to put your banana in the tailpipe (laughs) cut it out so uh (laughs) but yeah the kills aren't anything Michael Myers gets fucking beat with a net and trank darts and a fucking two by four. And Daryl Pleasance is just screaming, die, die, die. And it just represents exactly how I feel about this movie at the, at that particular point in time. I'm just waiting for it to die already. And I, also how I feel about this franchise. I just wanted to die. Because it's just been dying anyway ever since this film. So when it comes to the performances, we got Donald Pleasance, who's uneven. But he does a good job playing this disturbing asshole version of Loomis. Uh, Daniel Harris, really good. I thought she was fantastic in this. I just wish her performance was in a much better film. Uh, Ellie Cornell, she did fine with what little she had to work with. She was personable and likable as ever. Too bad she had to die. Bo Star, like I said, useless. Didn't really do much of anything. Wendy Kaplan, terrible. Should have died, like within the first twenty minutes. Tamara Glenn, sexy, but nothing much to her character. Don Shanks. He was decently intimidating as Michael Myers and he was a real trooper. I mean, he took a 2 by 4 to the face and broke his nose for this movie and also suffered burns and could have been horribly burned if he wasn't broken out of the burning car in time. And the rest of the actors and actresses, I mean, Jonathan Chapin, Matthew Walker, nothing really that impressive or memorable in any capacity cinematography by robert draper is fine it looks good it looks good enough uh the editing by charles titoni and jerry brady at times it's just off like it just feels like there are scenes missing and that's because there are scenes missing like the opening of this film is something completely different than what they originally planned something with dr death some like satanist guy who decides to bring michael myers back to life but instead they decided to go with some random old blind guy and let's rip off frankenstein for some reason and then michael myers just sits there while he lays there on a table for a year without doing anything until halloween a year later until he decides to wake up kill the old guy and then go back to haddonfield again And the whole Dr. Death thing wasn't the only thing that was cut out. I mean, there was the stuff with Ben Meeker that I mentioned earlier. But apparently there was also an entire sequence where Michael Myers took on a SWAT team. And that was cut from the movie. Why? Like, this film was boring. It was really hard to sit through. But, I mean, even I still would have perked up a little bit if that scene was put in the film. Uh, Apparently the movie got an X rating from the MPAA initially, 
uh, until they did some edits and some cuts. I'm curious to see that extra footage. I don't think it would have made the film great. I don't think it would have made it any better. Well, I mean, maybe a little bit better, because maybe it would have at least had a couple good kills. But, as it is, it doesn't even have good kills. It doesn't deliver the goods when it comes to the gore. And it's not that original or or unique when it comes to the kills. I mean, even Tina's sacrifice is just a boring knife to the chest. But I'm still legitimately curious about that SWAT team scene. Why would you cut that out anyway? Like, they even show, like, this whole bunch of police cars and stuff. And I think the SWAT team was supposed to be there in the house and in the climax. And they cut it out for some reason. I mean, even Don Shanks is disappointed that that scene was cut. There's a lot of stuff that was cut out. Like, there's also other alternate shots they did. Like, uh, the producers had K&B spend all this time and effort doing a burned version of Michael Myers' face when he unmasked. But they didn't go with that. And instead they went with the sympathetic, me, 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 my feelings, so upset me. <laughs> Instead, they went with that when they could have gone with some really cool, like, burned face makeup. And, you know, that would have been pretty cool. And maybe with the combination of, like, his face being horribly scarred and the tear and him crying, that might have had even more. Uh, that actually might have actually been somewhat impactful because now he really is a monster uh, under the mask. Because of all the, the injuries that he's received. So his soul is dark and corrupted by this evil. And he sees, you know, some hope in, in his niece. And he cries for that one moment for that one little bit of humanity that he still has left. But instead it just comes across as really forced when it comes to his emotion. But if you actually did show the burn makeup... That might have actually worked. But you didn't do that. So it just comes across as if he just randomly, out of nowhere, cries a tear. Like he's the the Indian in that commercial uh, who's crying about trash on the highway. And... And when, it's, when I'm talking about the editing, I mean, the opening credits with the fucking pumpkin, I guess a lot of people like that. To me, it's just, it's obnoxious with all the sound effects and, and quick cuts. And there's a lot of moments throughout this film that are like that with these quick cuts and these weird edits. And I I'm not, I'm not, don't really think it's that well edited of a movie either. Um, and the score by Alan Howarth is a real mixed bag. Like, there are some moments in the score that provides some decent mood. Uh, you know, there there's an all right rendition of the Halloween theme here and there. But there's other ones that sound like he's doing the Halloween theme with a, a kazoo and the clown music. And I just... I don't, I don't think it's one of his better scores. That's for sure. And for a film that's 97 minutes, it feels like it's 197 minutes after, you know, Rachel dies. Because, like I said, these characters, they suck. You don't care what happens to any of them. There's no suspense. There's no real intrigue. No matter how random, how, you know, how many random things this film throws at you when it comes to a story, none of them really are that captivating. And yeah, it wasn't very captivating to audiences either because it only made $11 million on a $6 million budget. I will say this, though. The documentary... On uh, the uh, Scream Factory Halloween box set. On the making of Halloween 5. Dead Man's Party. That was really entertaining. And enjoyable. And fun to watch. And honestly was better than this movie. I had a lot more fun watching that. Than I did re-watching this particular film. But yeah, I don't really know what else to say about the movie. I've ranted about it a lot longer than I thought I was going to. I, um, I hope you enjoyed it. And um, as always, I'll see you later. See ya.